Welcome to Fanfiction Audiobook. Muggle Magicians Hogwarts Rules of Survival. Chapter 1. Hello, I have your custom cake, is there anyone at home? Under the dim street lights, the cake shop employees who were wearing cake shop uniforms and temporarily acted as couriers patiently knocked on the door. The strange thing is, Mingming said on the ordering phone that there was definitely someone at home, but no one came out to open the door for a long time. He glanced at the address on the cake, number 17, Privet Road, Shaohujin District. That's right. That's a bit of a nuisance, as cakes made with animal cream don't last long in summer temperatures. The courier brother knocked on the door again. This time he heard a strange movement, but it was not from the house, but from behind. The courier brother turned his head blankly, and a shadow appeared behind him at some point. He was wearing a dark and smooth fur coat, a polished top hat, and a white mask on his face, like a dark night baron traveling through the darkness. These costumes are nothing, the suffocating thing is that he actually floats in the air. Ah, hello, Mr. Courier, Baron Knight said with a smile. Give me the cake. By the way, this is your tip. He stretched out his hand with a few coins in his hand, and the queen's head on the coin winked happily at the courier brother. What? The courier boy let out a scream, smashed the cake in his hand as a hidden weapon at the baron of the night, and fled in the direction of the street. Huh. The dark knight baron took the cake box with difficulty, and managed to stabilize the cake with his excellent balance ability. How did you escape? He turned around and shook his head helplessly as he looked at the escaped courier. The door was opened, and an expressionless boy of about ten came out. He has this soft, fluffy brown hair, and the calm and peacefulness in his pale blue eyes makes him look very mature. Although he is only in his teens, his outstanding appearance has already been reflected, and he can attract the attention of girls when he grows up a little. Yo, dear son, happy birthday. The shadow baron turned around again after hearing the voice, shouted in an exaggerated cheerful tone, and handed the boy the cake in his hand. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson, but please don't use exaggerated magic to scare others next time. Mrs. Fig on the opposite side said that there have been some not-so-good rumors in the community recently, and I don't want my family to be evicted by the community. The little boy rolled his eyes and took the cake. Oh, I just have some inspiration, I'm not willing to let it go. Mr. Wilson said with a smile. Yeah, I specially called the cake shop to bring the cake at night, just to let the night cover the wire behind you. The boy glanced behind Mr. Wilson. There were actually three sturdy rods hanging in the seemingly empty place, steel wire. It's too dangerous. Okay, I have to admit you're right, dear boy, come and help me, the pulley block seems to be malfunctioning, and I can't go back. Mr. Wilson was wriggling in the air like a caught carp. Louis John Wilson, the son of the, big, carp, in front of him, sighed, and had the urge to hang his disgraceful father overnight. Wilson is a magician, Louis's grandfather, John Wilson is a very good magician, once performed an exclusive escape magic for the queen. Lambert Wilson, the big carp that has just been put down, is good at large-scale magic, and likes to cooperate with large-scale scenes to create, miracle, magic effects. It made him more famous than the old Wilson, the kind of dazzling miracles that escape magic can't compare to. And Lewis, the boy who is just 11 years old today, is a magician who is good at using tricks and dexterous fingers to perform magic tricks. That is the beginner level. At the dining table, Mr. Wilson, who had changed into normal clothes, sat embarrassedly at his seat, obediently accepting Mrs. Wilson's complaints. I hope you're in moderation, dear. Mrs. Wilson is a gentle beauty, and no one can stand the pain when she stares at you with resentment. I don't want Lewis to be dragged down by his unreliable father when it comes to school selection. Don't worry, dear, our son is a genius, especially in mathematics and magic, and no school would want to miss him, said Mr. Wilson proudly. Speaking of school, Lewis did not speak, but he had already made a choice. Not those ordinary schools anyway. Lewis, pass me the jam, said Mr. Wilson. Lewis picked up the jam beside him and handed it over, while the knife collided with the plate and made a clanging sound. With a cheerful smile, Mr. Wilson couldn't wait to take the jam, but the next moment appeared in his hand was a bottle of sugar-free cheese. You should eat less sugar. The doctor has already said that your blood sugar is too high. Lewis shook the jam jar that appeared in his other hand at some point. 
Ha ha ha, wonderful performance, how did you do it? Mr. Wilson asked with great interest without the slightest anger being fooled. It's just a small way to distract your attention. Your attention was just distracted for a moment. Lewis said, pointing to the knife on the plate. Oh, that's right. Mr. Wilson suddenly realized. A very clever little trick, but it also requires solid basic skills. Well done, child. Lewis was accustomed to complimenting Mr. Wilson, he shrugged indifferently, and suddenly he was stunned, his eyes fixed on the font in the lower left corner of his field of vision. You fooled an experienced magician with extra focus, plus 100 fraud points. Gold finger. Lewis became excited in an instant, but after practicing magic for a long time, he resisted the change of expression and began to explore his gold finger. Lewis John Wilson, formerly known as Lin Mu, was an Englishman who was born and raised in the Chinese dynasty in his past life. And in the 11th year after he came to this world, he finally got the belated gold finger. The gold finger, called the fraud master system, can get various fraud points by deceiving others. Fraud. Cheat. It sounds bad, but Lewis still remembers the scene that just happened. He got cheat points when he used a little magic trick to hide from his father's eyes. Can a magician's deception be called deception? Kong Yiji dot JPG. For the fraud division system, this deception is also very particular. The smarter the deceived person is, the harder it is to deceive, or the stronger, stronger than Lewis, the greater the impact of deception and the more points earned. For example, cheating a confused old man can only get 1 to 5 points of fraud, an ordinary person can get about 20 or 30 points, a strong adult has about 50 or 60 points, and cheating an experienced magician can get it. 1 or 200 points. Fraud points can be used to raffle to get magical props, and every 100 points can be used for one ordinary raffle. This makes Lewis feel bad, thinking that you broke the system five or six years ago, and he has already reached the peak of his life. Lewis's house has never lacked magician performances, and Mr. Wilson, a famous magician, has been deceived countless times by Lewis's deceptive age. This rounded up to a loss of at least 100 million. With such a heartbreak, Lewis was half excited, half distressed, and finished his birthday cake in a complicated mood. The gift is in your room, go and unwrap it yourself, Mr. Wilson said to Lewis while helping Mrs. Wilson to clear the table after dinner. Lewis, who had been itching for the system for a long time, immediately cheered and rushed up to the second floor to return to his room. Why is the boy so happy all of a sudden? muttered Mr. Wilson. Did he find the gift you prepared for him? And he just wanted it. Guessed Mrs. Wilson. Our children are very smart. No, this is not wonderful at all. Surprise is the best compliment to a magician. Mr. Wilson said disappointedly. Mr. Wilson's lost Lewis, of course, did not know. He quickly ran back to the room, ignoring the huge gift that was placed on the ground and wrapped beautifully, sitting at the desk and watching the scenery outside the window called out the system. System, start the lottery. He ordered impatiently. Consume 100 points to start the normal level lottery. Handwriting flashed before his eyes, and then a vast sea of stars appeared. Every light spot in the vast star sea represents an item, and it is impossible to see what is inside each light spot. Before Lewis could react, one of the light spots suddenly flashed, expanding and obscuring all vision. A pair of pale blue illusory palms appeared in front of Lewis, and information about the thing flooded into Lewis's mind. Mage's hand, an invisible palm that moves with the mind, can grab items or attack the enemy, with three times the power of mental power. Mage's hand. Lewis's eyes lit up, and the first thing that came to his mind was to use this prop in magic. A palm that is invisible in the eyes of others, isn't rounding up the mind control. After getting the new toy, Lewis couldn't wait to start experimenting, from dexterity to strength test. After testing, the maximum weight of the magician's hand is 15 kilograms, and the maximum range of motion is 15 meters. The dexterity is similar to that of ordinary people's hands, but it is far from the hands of the magician Lewis. But that's good enough, and Lewis doesn't need the sophistication of the wizard's hands, the power and range alone are enough to surprise Lewis. Even if I go to Hogwarts, I will be the most beautiful boy. Lewis said with satisfaction, his eyes drifted out of the window, the fourth house in the same community across the road. 
The Dursley family, a family with a bad reputation in the community, including but not limited to their impolite son and harsh nephew. They adopted their nephew for free, a child named Harry Potter, but that child was not doing well. As bizarre as it may sound, Lewis was convinced that he had entered the world of Harry Potter after seeing the little boy next door who looked a little weak because of malnutrition and was constantly being bullied. And he lived opposite Harry Potter's uncle's house. It's a pity that Harry Potter, the protagonist's thighs, can't be hugged. It's a lot of trouble. If you don't hug him, you will die suddenly. Lewis shook his head and put away the mage's hand. Therefore, he has not been close to Harry in the past few years. If the relationship is too deep, it will be miserable in the later stage. Did he almost get sucked to death by a Dementor without seeing his cousin Dudley Dursley? Sky Blue is waiting for the misty rain, I'm waiting for the owl. Lewis sang a song out of tune, opened the gift hastily, and found that it was a complete set of Lego bricks. This thing seems a little too difficult for an ordinary 11-year-old child, but in Wilson's house, it can only be regarded as ordinary entertainment, and it is even more simple for Lewis. So he plans to play some flowers. After reading the manual, Lewis lay on the bed with his eyes closed, the hands of the two mages flying up and down. At this time, from the perspective of others, Lewis's room seemed to be haunted, only seeing the building blocks flying around and putting them together in an orderly manner. Lewis is just exercising the sensitivity of the mage's hand while entertaining. He doesn't want to be similar to his hand, at least to the level of a plus eagle, right? At this time, he was not panic at all, not at all worried that the Hogwarts owl would not come. What a joke, he is a transmigrator. No, 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 there will be no traveler who can't even enter Hogwarts, right? Throughout the summer, Lewis waited for the owl to arrive. Of course, he acted like a normal child during this process, obeying his parents' arrangements, choosing a school, preparing school uniforms, and performing everywhere by the way. The latter one belongs to family arts, magicians, who can't look forward to performances, not to mention that Lewis now has a fraudster system, every magic show is a scam with a lot of audience, these days he has made money 620 fraud points. Lewis kept these points and planned to save up for a 10 draw. Whether there are any rewards for 10 consecutive draws is another matter, 10 consecutive draws are the beliefs of mobile gamers. Although the harvest was fruitful, what Lewis looked forward to most every day was to find the letter from the mailbox that sent him Mr. Lewis John Wilson. However, for a long time, Lewis did not receive the long overdue letter, which made him more worried and even affected his mood. Mrs. Wilson soon discovered this, and that afternoon she came into Lewis's room with milk and a snack. Honey, do you need snacks and milk? She asked with concern. Thanks, Mom, that's exactly what I needed. Lewis, who was staring at the Dursleys, turned his head to look at his mother and smiled reluctantly. Anything unhappy? You've been in a bad mood lately, asked Mrs. Wilson. No, it's just that I haven't slept well recently, Lewis said casually. That's it, Mrs. Wilson certainly wouldn't believe it, but she didn't say much more understandingly and put down the milk and snacks, eat and rest. Okay. Lewis watched his mother leave, not even caring that the system didn't respond to the lame lie just now. Of course, that kind of words can't deceive close family members, but family members, occasional insignificant lies are nothing, compared to Lewis's problems now more serious. Today is the 13th of July, and the summer vacation is over halfway through, but he still hasn't received a letter from the owl. By contrast, Lewis has already seen a third wave of owls delivering letters to Harry Potter. This is it. Lewis had a vague guess, but he didn't seem to admit this shameful fact. With the last dignity of being a transmigrator, he wanted to confirm it. To die, to die to understand. The next day, Lewis told his parents early in the morning that he was going to go out to play, and the Wilsons, who were very reassured about Lewis, didn't care and let him go out. And Lewis did not go out without a target, he prepared enough money to move towards the destination. And his destination is Charing Cross Street, the location of the legendary Leaky Cauldron. The Leaky Cauldron is known as the place where the dream begins. Before entering Hogwarts, all students need to go to Diagon Alley to buy school supplies through here. Therefore, this is the entrance to the magical world. But when Lewis came to the busy Charing Cross Street, 
although he had expected it, when the truth was put in front of him, he was still a little hard to accept. There were no signs of broken cauldrons hanging in the crowded streets, and no wizards in fancy costumes entered or exited through shabby little doors. There wasn't a place called the Leaky Cauldron, or so there was, but Lewis couldn't see it. Because he's a muggle. Muggle is the name given to ordinary people without magical talent in the Harry Potter world. Although there is no discriminatory meaning, the existence of the word itself is discrimination. Even with the existence of Harry Potter, Lewis at this time doubted that this was not Harry Potter's world at all, otherwise there was no reason why his dignified traveler would be such a shameful muggle. He seemed to hear a sarcastic voice yelling in his ear, No, 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 no transmigrators are muggles. TNND. These days are over. Just when he didn't know who he was angry with, a father and daughter passed by him. They talked with each other. Although they lowered their voices, they still did not escape Lewis's ears. Unbelievable, those are all real, but are they really going to boil such a disgusting thing into medicine and drink it? This was his father's voice. That's called potions, and it's related to magic, um, but they are really disgusting as raw materials, the little girl said. Oh, a little wizard from a muggle family. Lewis looked curiously and saw a man holding a pile of things in his right hand and a girl with brown natural curly hair in his left hand walking forward. Lewis thought about it, walked over and stopped in front of the father and daughter, his eyes stopped for a moment on the girl's face, and asked, Hello, may I ask you to just come out of the leaky cauldron? The father and daughter stopped and looked at Lewis. The girl was particularly surprised and quickly asked, Are you also a wizard? She looked at Lewis's clothes. Are you from an ordinary family like me? Of course, beautiful lady. Lewis showed an impeccable smile, brushed his empty hand from the girl's ear, and withdrew his hand, and a gorgeous red rose appeared in front of her. At the same time, I'm also a magician. Quote. For you. He handed the flower to the girl. Introduce yourself. My name is Lewis Wilson. Just call me Lewis. Thanks, it's beautiful, the girl said with a smile. My name is Hermione Granger. Oh, it turned out to be Hermione. Lewis nodded calmly. Hello Hermione. Wilson. Magician. What's your relationship with Lambert Wilson? Asked the girl's father, Mr. Granger. That was my grandfather, a great magician. Lewis smiled modestly. It's unbelievable. I like your grandfather's magic very much. The man was a little excited, and suddenly he remembered something and asked, is old Mr. Wilson also a wizard? No, it's not, my grandfather was an ordinary person, and like I said, I came from an ordinary person's family. Lewis said with a smile. You deceived an adult observant dentist, you got 60 fraud points. You deceived an underage wizard, you got 150 deception points. Current fraud points, 830. You have contacted the wizard, open the second type of lottery, and each lottery at the boutique level consumes 500 points. A system prompt appeared in front of him, making Lewis almost unable to maintain the flat expression on his face. Not only the opening of the second type of lottery, but also the fraud points provided by Hermione. Underage wizards can provide so many fraud points. The reason why Lewis stopped Granger and his daughter was to try to deceive the wizard and see if there would be more fraud points, but he didn't expect a stone hammer. This point is higher than his father, and the wizarding world is heaven to him Lewis. But this paradise was blocked by a moat, because he was a muggle and couldn't go to Hogwarts to study. Can I only lie to Harry Potter every winter and summer vacation? Lewis was unwilling. Wait, things don't seem to have gotten to the point of being irreversible. A flash of light flashed in Lewis's mind, and suddenly a bold idea occurred to him. But this idea has not been realized yet, and Lewis intends to say goodbye to Hermione. Can we exchange addresses? I'd like to write to you if I get a chance. Lewis said with a smile. It's time for me to go back, but I don't want to miss this chance encounter. With a flip of his palm, he unwittingly took out the banknotes from a pocket on his body. As a magician, he is always used to carrying some strange things on his body, such as Lewis, who has a total of 17 pockets all over his body, containing a series of magic props such as glass balls, pins, tissues, artificial fingers, etc. Can not tell. Why not just exchange phone numbers? Hermione asked. It's the wizard's contact information, and they send letters in owls, just like our admissions letters, Lewis explained. 
Hermione thought it was very interesting, and happily left her address on it and gave it to Lewis. Lewis also took a piece of paper to write and draw, but finally gave Hermione a blank piece of paper. Huh. Is your pen out of ink? Hermione asked, looking at the paper. Of course not. Lewis squeezed the corner of the paper in Hermione's hand, and with a shake, the flames burned through the paper, leaving a charred address. Looking forward to the next meeting. Lewis bowed politely and waved away with the address of Hermione's house. Hermione blinked, happy that she had made a friend, she carefully put away this special contact information, but looked up to see her father looking at her with strange eyes. It always feels like that kid has bad intentions, said Mr. Granger, rubbing his chin. Don't be deceived by him. Dad, what are you talking about? Hermione rolled her eyes and hammered Mr. Granger in the stomach. I'm just curious if Lewis just used magic or magic. It should be magic, didn't the professor who can change into a cat say that magic needs that stick? It's a wand. You confuse an underage wizard with a simple little magic, you get fraud points, 200 points. After returning home, Lewis looked at the system's reminder record, and then focused on his points. 1030 points, enough for one ordinary 10 consecutive draws or two premium draws. Although the temptation of 10 consecutive draws is great, Lewis feels that you get what you get for every penny, and the premium lottery worth 500 points is more high-end than the ordinary lottery with 100 points. Let's choose the boutique lottery. Lewis made up his mind. System boutique lottery, twice. Following Lewis's instructions, a vast sea of stars appeared in front of his eyes again, only this time the starlight in the sky turned golden. Two golden lights lit up and almost blinded Lewis's eyes. After the light dissipated, two props with a soft glow appeared in front of Lewis's eyes. The first is a ring inlaid with dozens of emerald gemstones, called Portable Private Space Teleportation Point. According to the introduction, this is actually a common space ring in novels, but the principle is different. Those are portable spaces, this is a portable teleportation point, and the space does not know where it is fixed. But the effect is the same, and this portable teleportation point is more secure, it will not lose the stored items due to blowing up, and it only needs to copy a ring to enable it again. Of course, the current Lewis does not have this technology, and can only hope to see if he can get it in the future lottery. The second item was quite special. It was actually an eyeball, or the kind with black stripes on a red background. This familiar shape suddenly made Lewis call out a name. What the hell? Writing round eyes. Lewis read it right, this is indeed a writing wheel eye, or the kind of Sango Jade. But seeing this eyeball Lewis is in trouble. He has watched the anime and manga, Naruto, and naturally he knows the side effects of this thing. This thing will be burdened by people who are not from the Uchiha family. It will affect vision and consume a lot of money. It still consumes the unique chakra of ninjas. How can Lewis have that thing? And after this thing is installed, the eyes are blood red and hooked, and it looks so scary. Parents can't take him to the hospital when they see it. But after seeing the introduction of this eyeball, Lewis was relieved. Sharing eye Atesh 150 replica eliminates all side effects, cannot evolve, only has two abilities of weakening copy, low-level illusion, using no chakra to consume any energy, no energy will consume mental power, no obvious features after transplantation, full installation, uninstallation operation, without any worries. Although I don't quite know what the string of unintelligible English plus numbers behind this eyeball is, the effect of this thing is really fragrant, especially the two items that have no obvious features and full transplant operations. After getting the reward, Lewis hurriedly pressed the eyeball to the socket of his left eye, and the writing wheel immediately turned into a streamer and merged into the eyeball. Lewis only felt that the left eyeball was slightly warm and did not feel any discomfort. The mage's hand brought the mirror and placed it in front of him. The light blue pupils didn't change much, just a little darker, becoming a little deeper and looking more attractive. After confirming that the transplant was complete, Lewis stared at the mirror, trying to use the power of the replica shaker. In the blink of an eye, there is another mirror next to the mirror, from the frame to the mirror reflection is generally the same. Lewis looked at the two mirrors, and felt his state again. It was okay, but he felt a little tired, but it was still no problem to use this magic trick of sprinkling water 50 or 60 times. Lewis cancelled the illusion and focused on the ring again. 
the shape of this ring has nothing to say, and the effect is nothing to say. Lewis has tried to store and retrieve items more than a dozen times, and they are all as smooth as silk, and it has a certain mandatory collection effect. As long as the ring is within 10 meters of the center, he can take it directly even if it is tied to the table. Items. As for why the ring is the center, because Lewis can use the hand of the wizard to hold the ring to collect items remotely, which is extremely convenient. If it is used as a magic prop, the audience can't expose Lewis's trick even if they want to break their heads. However, if it is performed in front of a wizard, it is not enough to watch. Those magics are more magical than magic. If you want to deceive a wizard, you need more subtle means and layout. Simple magic isn't enough, so let's put on a wonderful performance. Lewis smiled at the Dursley house, which was occupied by owls. However, if the performance is to be completed, the key actors and props cannot escape. The Dursleys should soon be unable to stand the infestation of owls and choose to escape from here and go to a place where they don't know which bird doesn't shit. Hagrid could find that place, something an 11-year-old boy couldn't. They can't go, otherwise my only chance to get in will be gone, and they have to be held back. Lewis pondered for a long time. How to hold them back? The only thing a child can do is call the police. But for what reason? Child abuse. No, although Harry Potter's uncles and aunts were harsh to him, they couldn't talk about abuse, after all, they didn't do it, and even if the police came, there was no evidence. This kind of false alarm will only get you into trouble. What should be done then? Lewis frowned as he looked out the window at the Dursleys, and the owls caught his attention again. By the way, maybe this will be better. Lewis has an idea. On the other hand, the Dursleys soon became unbearable to be harassed by owls and planned to leave Little Whinging and move to a deserted place. Harry Potter naturally had a thousand unwillingness. He really wanted to go to the place called Hogwarts. From that letter, he felt the sense of being valued for the first time. Harry Potter was squeezed by the window with his fat cousin Dudley, and even though there was still a lot of room in the back seat, he still wouldn't let Harry go. It's all your fault, if it weren't for the owls you attracted by the freak I would have gone to play with my friends. Dooley Dursley murmured in dissatisfaction. He didn't dare to be too loud, because his doting father was like crazy at the moment, panting like an angry wild boar, and he didn't dare to provoke Vernon Dursley in this state. Harry Potter endured Dudley's bullying silently. After ten years of relying on others, he was very sensible. He knew that no matter how Dudley bullied him, no one would support him. Heavier than Dooley Dursley, Vernon Dursley, who looked like a big balloon, squeezed into the driver's seat cursingly. Listen, kid. Vernon Dursley stared at Harry Potter, who was huddled in the corner. You don't even think about going to that freak school. Look, I'm taking you to a place they'll never find. Harry Potter bowed his head, looking docile, but his hand was on the letter in his arms. It was secretly hidden by him, he was thinking that with Uncle Vernon's stop, he might not be able to go to that Hogwarts school in his life, but he could keep it as a memorial to the only one who valued him, place. The car started shaking slightly and slid out of the garage. Harry Potter looked out the window, and the owls cooed and looked at Harry in the car, tilting their heads. Farewell, owls. Harry Potter said goodbye to these friends in his heart, and at this moment, the car that had just driven out of the garage was forced to a stop, just listening to the screeching brakes to know how reluctant it was. A group of emotional people stopped the Dursleys, car. What are they going to do? Dooley Dursley forgot to bully Harry by lying on the back of the front seat of the car and looking at those people, Harry also had a chance to breathe, he leaned against the window and looked at those people curiously. Hey. Why are you guys standing in front of my door? Vernon Dursley stuck his head out, even though he was so angry that he was tortured by owls for days, he still tried his best to restrain his emotions. A man who appeared to be the organizer came out of the group, he walked over to the top hat and said to Vernon Dursley, sorry to disturb your vacation, but we have received reports that someone here is abusing owls. This led to the collective revenge of the owls. Owl abuse. It's ridiculous. Vernon Dursley panicked for a moment, after all, he did use some violence when driving the owl out. The organizer gave Vernon Dursley a meaningful look. Maybe, but don't worry, we'll investigate first. It's ridiculous, it's ridiculous, Vernon Dursley muttered, suddenly asking, who are you? Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, sir. 
The organizer handed out a business card. It's a bit abrupt, but your and your family's holiday is going to be delayed for a while. Why? You don't have the power to enforce the law. Of course, so we called the police. The organizer shrugged and smiled after hearing the sound of the police car. Look, the police are here. Compared with the police, the action of animal protection organizations is often faster, after all, they are less busy than the police. The culprit, Lewis, was standing at the window, watching the Dursleys, who were panicking like a policeman explaining something, and Harry, who was snickering on the side, very satisfied. In this way, at least it can hold them back for a week or two. Lewis said to himself. In the end, this farce ended in a very bland way. After a simple inspection, nothing abnormal was found. Those owls did not have any aggressive tendencies, they just squatted here. I don't know the reason, but this is the freedom of the owl, the police can't control it, and it should be the job of a bird behavior expert. During the period, members of the Bird Protection Association tried to attract these owls, but they were unsuccessful. These owls stood firm in their seats and looked at these muggles like fools. As magical creatures with high IQs, they naturally understand what these muggles want to do, but what does this have to do with the owls who deliver the letter? All they choose to watch. Eventually, the police alerted the organizers of the call and ordered them to leave. Although the gentlemen and ladies of the Bird Protection Association were very excited, they didn't say much without any evidence, and could only leave in despair. But their impact did not end, and before the police left, the police gave advice to the Dursleys. Although there is no evidence that you are abusing and protecting animals, for your safety, you should not go out in the near future. This is to clear your suspicions and to prevent you from being threatened by the Bird Protection Association. The police told the head of the family, Vernon Dursley, before leaving. What do you mean? Are they still hurting my family? Asked Vernon Dursley. There has never been such a case, but they have a record of killing foxes and cats, so be careful. The policeman shrugged, got in the car and left. Looking at the back of the police car leaving, Vernon Dursley shuddered. He looked at the owls around him who were staring straight at him, cursed inwardly, and took Harry Potter back with his family by the way, to the house. Wicked people have their own wicked grind. Although the Dursleys are not too evil, good people are not worth mentioning to the Dursleys. Only those who have no bottom line can threaten them. You fooled 13 people from the Bird Protection Association and gained 130 fraud points. In his room, Lewis's eyelids twitched at the system's prompt. Those 13 people together did not have as many fraud points as Hermione Granger alone, which was outrageous. This is also one of the reasons why Lewis wants to go to Hogwarts. Of course, the most important and the original reason is the pride of a dignified traveler, it is not easy to go to Hogwarts. After the system was activated, he didn't have to be a student if he wanted to enter Hogwarts, but to him, the wizarding world represented by Hogwarts was like a small map with a high explosion rate. Although, there are few, weirds, but each one is of high quality and can bring him more benefits. And this is only one chance for the limited time map, if you miss it, you will not be able to get in for the rest of your life. Lewis's arrangement was very effective. Under the threat of the Bird Society, the Dursleys gave up their plan to go out. They could only hide at home and endure the harassment of owls. But their hard days should be almost over, July was drawing to a close, and Harry Potter's birthday was approaching. Lewis yawned, rubbed his eyes, and sat by the window sill staring. No way, he didn't know when Hagrid would come when he didn't need to bother looking for Harry, and his flying bike had magic that would keep muggles unnoticed, and if he missed it, Lewis would be lost. So he can only use this pure method to keep an eye on it. However, this is not without benefits. Staying up all night to cultivate immortals has the ability to train himself. Now Lewis can easily use the two abilities of Sherinian, and he has also figured out some necessary illusion techniques along with his mental power. Significant growth. It is foreseeable that he will need to use illusion as magic for a long time, so some illusions that can be observed must be prepared in advance. As for the rest, Lewis glanced at his fraud points, and it was still 160 points. Instead of wasting on the ordinary lottery, it is better to save for the high-quality lottery, which will help him even more. Didi. Didi. The electronic alarm clock sounded the time, it was 12 o'clock, and the date jumped to July 31st, which was Harry Potter's birthday. 
If nothing else, today should be Hagrid's time to pick up Harry. Lewis's eyes widened, staring intently at the Dursley's door. He can't even see the flying motorcycle and can't see people. Hagrid's overall figure is still very conspicuous. Suddenly, a huge figure appeared on Privet Road. Lewis was convinced that the road just now was empty, and that figure appeared out of nowhere. It's finally here. Lewis was a little nervous, because his plans had officially begun. Boom. 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 The loud knock on the door woke Harry, who was sleeping. His heart skipped a beat, at this time, this unusual visitor gave him a bold guess. The visitors outside the door are coming for him. However, he lived in the stairwell closest to the gate, but he couldn't be the first to rush out to meet him, because Uncle Vernon locked the stairwell with a lock before going to bed, and he couldn't get out. Who, what are you doing knocking so loudly so late? It was Aunt Petunia's voice, as she descended the stairs, each step throwing a little dust over Harry's head. He heard Aunt Petunia approaching the door. She sounded a little sluggish, and she was going to open the door directly in the face of the suspicious knock. But just as she was about to open the door, Uncle Vernon rushed down to stop her. Wait, Petunia. Uncle Vernon shouted warily, looking at the swinging door. Who are you? The people outside did not answer him, but knocked on the door more violently. The door frame was shaking, the floor vibrated with it, and the Dursleys looked at the gradually deformed door frame in horror. Boom. With a loud bang, the door was attached to the door frame and fell to the ground with a bang. A giant over three meters tall, dressed in linen and animal skins, holding a broken umbrella, with messy hair and beard, bowed his head and walked away. Come in. His body is so huge, which makes the rather spacious hallway extremely narrow. Vernon Dursley, are you the villain? Huh. The giant's voice buzzed like a vibrating urn. Where's Harry? You monster, get out of my house. Vernon Dursley was frightened by the giant, and he screamed loudly, trying to drive the giant away. It's up to you, I'm here to pick Harry up to go to Hogwarts, and I won't leave unless I pick him up. The giant didn't care about the threat of the fat man in front of him, his eyes crossed Germany's the Seelies looked inside the house. Where's Harry? Boom. Boom. The excited Harry was slamming on the stairwell door, fearing that the person who came to pick him up outside would think he wasn't here and leave if he didn't make a sound. When the giant heard the movement, he looked at the narrow space under the stairwell, and anger appeared on his simple and honest face. He pushed the Dursleys away, walked quickly to the door of the stairwell, grabbed the door lock with his huge palm and twisted it lightly, twisting the metal lock into a twist. The door opened and a dusty Harry slipped out. He looked up at the giant figure and took a deep breath, but he was not afraid, more surprised and curious. Who are you? He asked. You can call me Hagrid, I'm the key keeper and gamekeeper at Hogwarts, but that doesn't matter, what matters is that I'm here to pick you up to Hogwarts. Hagrid hugged his stomach and bent down, said amiably. He's not allowed to go anywhere, I'll definitely allow him to go to your madman's school. Vernon Dursley, who didn't know where the courage came from, growled and rushed over to grab Harry's arm. Hagrid's thick caterpillar eyebrows raised and pushed Vernon Dursley away. He just gave it a slight push, but he pushed Vernon Dursley to the ground, slapping his fat body on the ground. Penny Dursley jumped with a scream and helped Vernon Dursley. He belongs to Hogwarts, and he was born to go to Hogwarts, the best wizarding school in the UK. Hagrid said proudly. The best magic school. Harry looked longingly. Uncle Vernon has always said he only deserves to go to a school like St. Brutus Safe Center for Juvenile Offenders and not the best in the UK, but now someone else says he deserves the best school. Although the man was a little older and rougher, Harry thought he was a good man in his heart. Okay, let's go, Harry, take your things. Hagrid said, stroking Harry's head. Yeah, Harry nodded excitedly. He took out his clothes from his room, wrapped them in sheets, and carried them on his back. As if he had fantasized about running away from home countless times in the past, he prepared his poor luggage and followed him. Behind Hagrid. This time Vernon Dursley didn't dare to stop him. This giant was a real tiger. He almost broke his waist with a wave of his hand. He could only watch Harry follow Hagrid away. Tell you, you can take him away, but he will never come back in this life. Vernon Dursley looked at the backs of one big and one small leaving, as if to save his dignity, and threatened loudly. Harry's pace was steady and unaffected, and Hagrid just gave him a contemptuous look back. 
Even a mere muggle dare to speak madly. An oblivion spell will keep you from finding North. It's okay, I'll leave this to Dumbledore. Hagrid thought and walked out the door. Walking out of the house where he had lived for eleven years, Harry suddenly became a little worried. He glanced at Hagrid and asked, where are we going now? Go to Diagon Alley and buy school supplies. Hagrid replied patiently. But I don't have the money, can I afford it? Harry said disappointedly. And without Uncle Vernon paying the tuition, can I go to school? How dashing he was when he just left, how uneasy Harry is now. Ha ha ha, don't worry, Harry, your parents left you a lot of stuff, Hagrid said. I'll take you there now, and you'll know when we get there. How do we get there? By bus. Harry asked. It's a good choice, but I have a better way. Hagrid was a little smug, and said in a showy tone, how about taking you on a flying motorcycle? Flying motorcycle. Harry's eyes sparkled with anticipation. Well, that's right, right there. Hagrid pointed to the side of the road and suddenly he found a small figure standing beside his motorcycle. Who? Who's where? Hagrid called out in confusion. Strange, that motorcycle has a spell to prevent it from being seen by muggles, so it shouldn't be discovered. As he got closer, Hagrid realized that it was just a boy who looked about the same age as Harry. Lewis turned slowly to look at the tall Hagrid and Harry. Hello, he said, looking at Harry. My name is Lewis Wilson, and I was just curious to see your motorcycle falling out of the sky. Hi, my name is Harry Potter. Harry looked at Lewis, wondering what was going on. Can you see it? Hagrid walked over frowning, checked the bike, and found that the spell on it didn't work. Of course, I can see clearly. Lewis said with a serious face. If you can see it, there is a ghost. Lewis once again confirmed his identity as a muggle. The reason why he can accurately appear next to the flying motorcycle is because he swept the surrounding streets with the hand of the wizard. It's amazing, how did it fly? Lewis asked innocently. I can't tell you that. Hagrid said casually, continuing to examine the bike. Can't tell. Are you a magician too? Is this your magic tool? Lewis asked. Magic. No no no. Hagrid double checked, made sure there was nothing wrong with the bike, looked at Lewis and asked, how old are you this year? Eleven, birthday just two weeks ago, Lewis replied. Eleven. That's a little weird, did you get a letter from Hogwarts? Hagrid asked again. No, Hogwarts. What is that? Lewis asked blankly. Hagrid hesitated with his wand in the shape of a broken umbrella. He was debating whether to take the boy or give him an oblivion spell. His mission this time was to take Harry to prepare for school, and to go to Gringotts to get the Philosopher's Stone. He shouldn't have been busy. But the eleven-year-old in front of him could clearly see the muggle-blocking motorcycles, but he didn't have a Hogwarts admission notice. Dumbledore can't go wrong, but maybe it's the owl other than the problem. Hagrid muttered to himself in a very loud voice. Your name is Lewis, right? I think you should go home first, and after a while, an owl should send you a letter of admission, just like Harry, don't worry, maybe the owl who sent you the letter just got lost. Hagrid said he felt a little too much, it sounded too perfunctory. Admission letter. I don't know what kind of school it is, but I think it might be too late, Lewis said. It's probably too late for me to prepare. Yes, you're right. Hagrid, who was already a little remorseful, was immediately persuaded by Lewis. What can I do? Where are you going now? Go to the Leaky Cauldron for one night, then go to Diagon Alley the next day to buy some necessities, Hagrid said. Why don't you bring me one? I can prepare before the letter comes, so I don't worry about wasting time, Lewis suggested. Um, that makes sense. Hagrid nodded approvingly. But what about your family? I need to inform them, and it's best to have someone with you, and you need to exchange muggle currency for galleons. It's okay, I'll call my father, he shouldn't be asleep by now. Lewis said nonsense with his eyes open. Please wait a moment. Then, the sleepy-eyed Mr. Wilson was dragged out of bed by Lewis forcibly, and was forced to stand in the living room without disturbing Mrs. Wilson's sound sleep. Are you sleepy? Lewis, what magic? What flying motorcycles and giants riding motorcycles, I don't remember buying you such a fairy tale book. Mr. Wilson touched after listening to Lewis's explanation. There is no fever in his forehead. If you are in doubt, it is better to see the master, and don't wake up mom. Lewis made a silent gesture, 
put on your wallet and come with me. The best thing about having a magician father is that he has enough patience and acceptance, and the awareness to spend a night with you if it's a big deal. In short, Lewis brought his father out smoothly and came to Hagrid. Well, Lewis, I have to admit, the giant you're talking about is true. Mr. Wilson looked up at Hagrid, pressing his hat. Hi, hello, this tall gentleman, what's your name? My name is Hagrid, Mr. Wilson. Hagrid introduced himself and introduced Harry by the way. This is Harry. Oh, Harry, I know this one. You're Dursley's nephew. Mr. Wilson nodded to Harry. Hello, Mr. Wilson. Harry recognized the famous neighbor, whose magic show was said to be hard to come by. It turned out that Lewis was the son of this Mr. Wilson, and their relationship was so good, so enviable. Mr. Wilson didn't know what Harry was thinking, and he looked at Lewis again. But where are the flying motorcycles you said? There are no motorcycles here. Lewis made a puzzled expression after confirming the position of the motorcycle with the hands of the wizard, can't you see it? It's here. He pointed to the location on the side of the road. But I didn't see anything. Mr. Wilson walked over suspiciously, then tripped over the motorcycle and fell into the sidecar body. Oh. Watch out for Mr. Wilson. Hagrid picked up Mr. Wilson quickly. This motorcycle has a spell on it that muggles can't see. Mr. Wilson had just confirmed the existence of the motorcycle by touch, but his doubts did not diminish. Instead, because of Hagrid's words, he added, what is a muggle? Ordinary people like you who don't understand magic, Hagrid said. I don't like this name very much. It sounds a bit discriminatory. Mr. Wilson kept his feet on the ground and straightened his clothes. So when are we going? You're very receptive, and I'm still thinking about how to explain it to you. Hagrid praised. It's just a magician's self-cultivation, and I can't wait to learn about that magical world. Mr. Wilson said, how do we go? Although we only contacted for a moment, I think this flying motorcycle does not. Not much. Don't worry, it's going to be big enough. Hagrid tapped the motorcycle with the broken umbrella, and with the sound of the tires rubbing, the body of the motorcycle got bigger. Harry was stunned, watching this magical scene in surprise. Be careful Mr. Wilson, you can't see it. Hagrid gestured and pulled Mr. Wilson inside. Wait, I need to leave a note for my wife so she doesn't worry. Mr. Wilson hurried home after saying that, and hurried out again after a while. Okay, okay, he said. Hagrid helped Mr. Wilson get on the motorcycle, turned around and waved to the two children. Come on, Harry, Lewis, go on your own. Harry naturally climbed onto the motorcycle, which in his eyes was a bit tattered but amazing, and Lewis, calmly using the mage's hand, let himself sit firmly on it. Okay, get ready, let's go. Hagrid shouted and started the motorcycle. With Mr. Wilson's exclamation, the motorcycle carrying four people flew towards the sky. Oh my god. Can't we make the motorcycle visible? I can't see the motorcycle at all. It's like sitting on the air and flying into the sky. Mr. Wilson exclaimed. Be patient, dad, it will be there soon. Lewis, who is also enjoying this kind of treatment, said with a sullen face. He can't see either, and his legs are weak. There are three difficulties for Lewis to enter Hogwarts. First, the pen of acceptance, the book of admission. These two things may be Lewis's worst enemies, they can detect and record children with magical talents throughout the UK, and when they reach the age, they will be issued a notice of admission by Hogwarts. And as a pure muggle, he will definitely not leave a name on it. But fortunately, they are all dead things, as long as they insist that it has made a mistake and show their magical talent, they should be able to get through. Second, buy a wand. Buying a wand requires going to Ollivander's wand shop in Diagon Alley, where wands are often picked one-to-one -one and there must be enough signs to be considered suitable for the wand. But to muggles, a wand is a stick, and it can't make flowers when you wave it. This is fortunate, the magician's hand and illusion should be able to fool the past. The third is the old wizard Dumbledore. He was an old wizard of great experience and wisdom, and he was still full of energy even at his age. He is also a master of dementia, who can see through a person's heart with just one look. But he is a good person, a good person has a bottom line and is soft-hearted, and he gave Lewis room to operate in many things, so it is not too difficult to deal with. The flying motorcycle landed on Charing Cross Street in a grand manner, and stopped at the location of the broken cauldron bar. 
At this time, there were not many people in Charing Cross Street. There were only occasional drunkards passing by, but they didn't notice the motorcycle falling from the sky. They just muttered intoxicated words that only they could understand, and took the initiative to bypass the broken road. The location of the cauldron bar. Because they stopped directly at the leaky cauldron and passed the range of the muggle-expelling charm, Lewis and Will were not affected, and they saw the shabby signboard and the grey wooden door at a glance. Is this the leaky cauldron? It looks very mysterious indeed. Mr. Wilson, whose legs were a little weak, climbed off the motorcycle while holding Lewis's shoulders. You're the first muggle to say that, and usually they'll think this place is so shabby, Hagrid's voice shouted. It's no wonder that your facade is really not very good. Although it is very mysterious, it is too old. But understandably, I don't think this place is open to ordinary people. Mr. Wilson shrugged and said. It was really open to muggles for a while, and wizards here are welcome to muggles, but you know, oh, you don't know, wizards are always on the sidelines, and the topics they discuss are for muggles it was so bizarre that many muggles couldn't accept it and just left. Hagrid parked his motorcycle and grabbed his broken umbrella. Let's go, it's time to go in. As the doorbell rang, Hagrid pushed open the door, and in the empty bar, only an old man wiped the glass with a rag using magic. Oh, Hagrid, haven't seen you for a while, what have you been doing lately? The old man glanced at Hagrid and didn't notice the other people standing behind him waiting for the big guy. Mr. Wilson was not dissatisfied with being ignored. He looked curiously at the rag that could be moved by himself, and his hands were about to move. Tom, good evening, it's true we haven't seen each other for a long time, I'm helping Dumbledore, I can't say what exactly, but there is one thing I can tell you. Hagrid pulled Harry from behind. Look, who is this? The old man called Tom first glanced casually, and suddenly he seemed to remember something, and his eyes stayed on Harry's forehead. Oh my god, he's Harry Potter. Tom stood up from behind the bar, nearly knocking over his glass. Harry was taken aback and tried to hide behind Hagrid but Hagrid held him firmly. Equally startled was Mr. Wilson, who looked at Tom, then looked at Harry, leaned over to Lewis and said, it seems that Dursley's little nephew has a very unusual status here. Of course not ordinary, this is the savior. Lewis thought about it, but didn't say it, just nodded reservedly like a normal underage muggle wizard. That's right, Harry Potter, the great Harry Potter. Hagrid laughed heartily, with an air of pride. Hagrid, is there something wrong with me? Harry had never felt this kind of attention, and he felt a little joy but also a little uncomfortable. It's nothing, you're a hero here because you killed, you know who, back then. Hagrid patted Harry on the shoulder, okay Tom, don't talk, give us three rooms, it's getting late. It's time rest, and tomorrow I will take little Harry and this little Mr. Wilson to buy school supplies. No problem, the third floor. Tom threw three keys after hearing this. Call me if you need anything, and I'll let the female worker go up. Thank you, come to you for a drink another day. Hagrid waved his hand and led Harry and the Wilsons upstairs. The next morning, Mr. Wilson, who couldn't wait, shook Lewis awake. I can't believe you can sleep so soundly in a place like this, said Mr. Wilson. I can't wait. I can understand, Dad, after all, magicians should have such a strong curiosity to improve. Lewis yawned sleepily. For an 11-year-old child, it was really painful to stay up late, and he slept very late last night, so his spirit was not very good. Well said, dear son, I think you will become a great magician in the future. Mr. Wilson was very satisfied with Lewis's answer. Especially after you become a magician. It might be more formal to be called a wizard, but dad, I don't think being a wizard means I can use magic at will. Lewis said while getting up to wash. Why? Probably a law. Or a rule. Otherwise, the world would be full of wizard news. Lewis shrugged. It makes sense. After a while, there was a knock on the door, and Hagrid and Harry had reached the door. Sorry to disturb you so early, but Harry is impatient. He is looking forward to seeing the magical world. Hagrid bowed his head at the door and said to Mr. Wilson who opened the door. Oh, so do we, and we're all looking forward to what we'll see, Mr. Wilson said with a smile. Several people went downstairs together, and the bustling bar hall was displayed in front of them. Several men and women dressed in odd costumes were distributed in several places in the hall alone or in pairs. 
They ate the breakfast provided by the bar and raised their hands to control the spoon to stir coffee while watching the moving newspaper. The simplest and most everyday magical world was just like this, and both Harry and Mr. Wilson were stunned for a while, with great interest in those moving newspapers and spoons. But they were clearly not as interested in these magical things as those wizards were in Harry Potter. I don't know who was the first to notice the lightning scar on Harry Potter's forehead and shouted Harry Potter, and soon, the whole bar crowded around. Lewis and Mr. Wilson, who were irrelevant people, were squeezed out, and only Hagrid stayed by Harry's side with his physique. Harry looked at the people around him with panicked eyes, each of them had kindness and admiration on their faces, and everyone's eyes were full of kindness, not like his uncle and aunt, nor like his like Dudley's cousin who bullied him. Harry felt an emotion called belonging, which made him feel like he was born to be a part of the wizarding world, and an emotion called pride grew in the compliments and self-introductions around him. Lewis looked at Harry, who was clearly overexcited, thoughtfully. What's the matter Lewis, are you envious of him? Mr. Wilson asked, patting Lewis on the head. No, no, his honor was earned by the death of his parents. Lewis said calmly. It's true. Little Potter is indeed a poor child. Even if he has the honor of being a wizard, he himself lives in a world of ordinary people where these honors cannot shine. Mr. Wilson said with a sigh. Your expression is a little strange, did you think of something? I'm just wondering if Harry's miserable life at his uncle and aunt's house was intentional, in order to increase Harry Potter's identity as a wizard, Lewis said. Otherwise, the wizards could throw something at random to make the Dursleys throw their wits about them, and even to curry favor with Harry Potter, but that would only allow Harry to immerse himself in the comforts of ordinary people, even if he would go to Hogwarts and be spoiled. He wouldn't necessarily choose to fight Voldemort either. Dumbledore is playing a big game. Mr. Wilson was taken aback. Lewis, how can you have such a terrible thought? This is so, mature, you are only 11 years old. I'm a genius, Lewis said casually. He looked around, looking for something. What are you looking at? Asked Mr. Wilson. Find someone, Lewis said. He was looking for Quirinus Quirrell, who was possessed by Voldemort. As the villain of the first book in the Harry Potter series, this one appears from the beginning to the end of the first step, but in fact Quirinus Quirrell is just a container, and what actually works is Voldemort. And Voldemort, as one of the best wizards in the Harry Potter world, if he can give this guy a, little joke, at the beginning of the game, it must be very beautiful. Of course, the specifics of how to do it depended on the situation, and it was necessary to not leak the bottom line, so Voldemort couldn't let Voldemort find himself. Soon, Lewis locked onto his target, the tall and thin man with a cloth wrapped around his head, wearing a long robe and looking like an Indian, with a pale face that seemed to be shaking slightly. It was Quirinus Quirrell, now possessed by Voldemort. Quirinus Quirrell had been careful to keep his distance from Harry, and didn't walk over to greet Harry until the enthusiasm of the people around him had dissipated. Thanks to Quirrell's presence, his refusal to shake Harry's hand digs Harry out of his vanity. Hagrid didn't have such careful insight. He didn't even notice the change in Harry's expression from beginning to end. He just introduced Harry to Professor Quirrell's identity and took him and the Wilsons to the back door of the bar. Harry and Lewis, you have to remember that the next time you want to enter Diagon Alley, you just need to knock three times near the two bricks on the top of the trash can, and the door to Diagon Alley will open. Like this. Hagrid picked up the small broken umbrella and demonstrated it. As he finished tapping, the bricks on the wall spun as if alive, and moved towards the two sides, and a street emerged. The old streets were crowded with people, wizards in pointed hats and robes shopping in the streets surrounded by crooked buildings, and this magical scene immediately satisfied the curiosity of Mr. Wilson and Harry Potter. There are many wizards who don't enter through the leaky cauldron, they seem to suddenly appear in the fireplace in the alley, the fireplace seems to be endless, and every now and then a wizard in a robe comes out. Mr. Wilson showed great interest in the fireplaces that dotted the corners of the street, and if it wasn't for Lewis pulling him, he might have been digging in. Those are fireplaces for flow fans, designed to provide convenient transportation for wizard families, even if they live far away, they can get here quickly, Hagrid said. He led Lewis and others through the street, and the shops on both sides of the road kept attracting everyone's attention. I have to admit that although Lewis has seen similar scenes in movies in his previous life, 
there is still a different kind of immersion. Experience. What are we going to do now? Oh, Gringotts. Mr. Wilson, an adult after all, asked Hagrid quickly from the roadside stall selling quirky things. That's right, Harry needs to take what his parents left behind, and you need to exchange some galleons, the wizard's currency, Hagrid said. What's the exchange rate like? Wilson asked. I'm not sure about this, you need to ask the goblins, Hagrid said. Several people walked into the crooked Gringotts, and Mr. Wilson found an elf with a rebellious expression and asked his own question. Five pounds to one galleon, said the elf in a dry voice. This is limited to 100 galleons only for freshmen at Hogwarts. How about converting galleons to British pounds? Lewis asked curiously. Same price, but no limit. Oh, it looks like the wizarding world is pretty confident in its currency, said Mr. Wilson, pulling out his wallet. A lot of things can be done with magic for wizards, so muggle currency isn't very useful, Hagrid said. Are you taking Harry to his vault? Lewis asked. Not exactly, I still have my own business, but it's something important and secret. Hagrid plotted loudly in his usual loud voice. Lewis's eyelids twitched, thinking that Dumbledore's heart is too big to let you do such an important thing. Of course he knew what Hagrid was going to do. He must have taken out the Philosopher's Stone in the Gringotts' vault. That thing was a magical item that could turn a stone into gold and make an elixir of immortality. Quirinus Quirrell came for the Philosopher's Stone, and he'd be stealing the Philosopher's Stone before long, but failed because Hagrid had taken the Philosopher's Stone first. Pretty miserable villain. It's okay Hagrid, we're waiting for you here, after all we don't know where and what to buy, Lewis said. You know I haven't received an admission letter. Okay, then you can wait outside for a while, it won't be long. Hagrid nodded and led Harry to the deepest counter in Gringotts. Mr. Wilson left Gringotts with Lewis, waiting for Hagrid and Harry in the bustling streets. Mr. Wilson is still looking at the surrounding scenes. Until now, Mr. Lewis has only had a taste of the magic of the wizarding world, but at this time he has begun to peep here through the wizard's bright and beautiful coat decorated with magic and magic. Essence. To be honest, son, this is not the place for a magician to live, said Mr. Wilson. Why? Because magical magic is more magical and less flawed than magic. Lewis asked. No, although magicians need to rely on magical performances to attract attention, magicians rarely perform the same magic on the same occasion, because it means your tricks will be more easily debunked. Mr. Wilson eloquently said, for a magician, immutability is the greatest natural enemy. This world seems magical, but it's like a fish that slips through the net of time. It's like a pool of stagnant water. It's like seeing what the wizards in the past looked like. Looking at the expressions and clothes of those wizards, I seem to look at the past again. Oil painting. Mr. Wilson shook his head. The arrogant eyes, coupled with the unchanging robe and pointed hat, they look down on ordinary people but are left behind by ordinary people. This kind of contentment with the status quo will cause problems sooner or later. Lewis did not expect that his father would suddenly say such a profound truth, and he felt a little uncomfortable for a while. Then dad, do you think it's not good for me to study here? I didn't say it's bad, it's time to go up, you shouldn't be too skilled, but you don't want to be assimilated by this stagnant water, you have to maintain enough enthusiasm, understand. Mr. Wilson rubbed Lewis's head and said. Got it. Lewis nodded. Understood, always maintain the enthusiasm of a cheater, if you have the opportunity to cheat, if you don't have the opportunity to create an opportunity, you will also cheat. Lewis immediately, factored awareness, and didn't care if there was a difference between what he realized and what Mr. Wilson said. The father and son chatted happily, and after a while, the tall Hagrid walked out of Gringotts with Harry. Harry's expression was a little dazed, and he might not have recovered from the mountains of gold and silver. Let's go Lewis, I'll take you to make the uniforms, then buy the cauldrons, the textbooks, and finally pick up the wand. Hagrid beckoned Lewis to follow. First go to Mrs. Malkin's long-distance running store. Lewis and Mr. Wilson reunited with Harry Hagrid. Mr. Wilson began to inquire about the customs of the wizarding world from Hagrid, and Lewis listened to the uncontrollable Harry sharing his excitement. I didn't expect my parents to do so much for me. Harry's eyes were red and he rubbed his eyes. Hagrid told me about Voldemort, he said he was a terrible guy who killed a lot of people. 
wizard, but he died at my hands, as a baby. It sounds so bizarre, what does a baby do to kill an adult wizard? Lewis said with mock surprise. I don't know either. Harry was also confused. On the way to the robe shop, Harry began to ramble on what he had seen in Gringotts, such as the long railroad tracks, the strange waterfall, and the sound of unknown monsters circling the void. Hagrid said it was the cry of a fire dragon, and he's always wanted one, Harry said. Lewis listened attentively at first, replying from time to time, but he soon realized that he didn't need it at all, because Harry's eyes were already drawn to the things in the shop windows on both sides of the road. Strange shaped silverware, bat spleens, eel eyeballs, toad skins, parchment, medicine bottles, and planetariums, these things that normal people have never seen before, are splendidly sold in these shops, and the prices are not cheap. Soon, under the leadership of Hagrid, Lewis and Harry finished measuring their bodies, customized uniforms, and bought a series of school supplies such as crucible books, and came to one of the three difficulties in Lewis's admission. Shop for Wands. Ollivander's Wand Shop, one of the oldest in Diagon Alley, has the words Ollivander, well-made wands since 382 BC on the peeling gold sign. After some dull bells, a group of four walked into the small shop. The hall is small, with only one bench as furniture, and the rest is filled with long and narrow cartons of wands, which are piled up to the ceiling, with active dust floating in the air. He seemed to hear movement at the door. With the sound of the pulley, a ladder dexterously came out of the wand pile. It was extremely fast without touching any wand box, and then stood firmly in front of several people. An old gray-haired man came down the ladder, looked at Harry, then at Lewis, and then on Harry again. Ha ha ha, I think it's almost time, Harry Potter, it's time for you to go to school. Come and pick a wand from me. Yes, I only have the best wand in the UK. The old man was bright and full of energy, quite different from his aged appearance. Good morning, boys, my name is Garrick Ollivander, and as you can see, I'm the boss here, he introduced himself. My name is Harry Potter. My name is Lewis, the two children replied. Well, Harry Potter naturally needs to be said, and then you, well, I have no record, it seems that you are a lucky one from a muggle family. Ollivander nodded and snapped his fingers. Two sets of measuring tools jumped out of the corner formed by the accumulation of wand boxes. They jumped onto Harry and Lewis as if they were alive, and began to measure incredible data. Arm length and height are understandable. What do you do with your nostril spacing? Lewis muttered to himself, but instead of showing it, he stared at Harry. He needs to determine what kind of special effects he should need when choosing the right wand, and it will be easy to simulate it with illusion. Two in total, let me see what kind of wand is right for you. Ollivander looked at the two children, which one of you came first? Let Harry come first, Lewis volunteered. Okay, a child who knows how to be humble, very good, then let Mr. Potter come first. Ollivander looked at Harry's data, turned and took out a wand from his side. Come on, wave it. Harry took the wand and waved it at Ollivander's request, and the wind swept through, and the wand lifted a gust of wind as if it was agitated and knocked one down to the wand mountain. Looks like this doesn't fit, Ollivander didn't care about the wands being blown all over the place, and turned around to give Harry another one. Try this. Harry looked awkwardly at the wand boxes all over the floor and waved them carefully. Boom. A mass of air cannons seemed to emerge from the top of the wand, and an explosion sounded in the air, opening a hole in the wall. The picky guest Ollivander was unmoved and took out another wand. Go on. Mr. Wilson's face twitched, and he patted Lewis on the shoulder. Looks like magic is dangerous. Indeed. Lewis nodded. There was nothing wrong with the third wand. The moment Harry held this wand of destiny, a golden light seemed to light up around him. At this time, Ollivander's face became serious. He took the wand from Harry's hand and began to popularize the wand's relationship with Voldemort to Harry. Both Mr. Wilson and Harry listened intently, and Lewis wasn't interested in this cliché, his attention being blown to the ground by Harry's wand. Anyway, he is a muggle, and the special effects rely on illusions, so just pick one that is pleasing to the eye. With this thought in mind, Lewis set his sights on a wand that looked the most unique. Compared with other smooth and well-proportioned wands, this wand has obvious round nodules, which looks a little strange and inexplicably familiar. It's just that Lewis can't remember where he's seen it for a while. 
Don't worry, it's yours. The more Lewis looked at it, the more interesting it became, and he grabbed it, and then a circle of ripples swayed under his left eye, and the illusion was blessed on him. The faint golden light caught the attention of Ollivander, who was explaining the relationship between this wand and Voldemort to Harry. He first glanced at Lewis, but he didn't care. He just thought he was lucky and just found a wand that suits him, but after reading it, I was a little unsure. I took a closer look and found the difference between the wand in Lewis's hand. Wait. Ollivander stared at Lewis with wide eyes. You, how could you possibly react to this wand? Lewis's heart skipped a beat, and he said, is there something wrong with the wand I'm holding? Isn't it, just stepped on the thunder. Is there something wrong with this wand? Seeing the excited Ollivander about to rush up, Mr. Wilson quickly stopped Ollivander. Mr. Ollivander, what happened? Hagrid and Harry also looked at Ollivander in amazement. Ollivander didn't have such a big reaction when Harry chose the wand from the same source as Voldemort's wand core. Do you know what wand this is? Ollivander asked solemnly, staring at Lewis. Ah, I don't know. Lewis twitched the corners of his eyes and said bravely, I think it has a good eye for it, so I picked it up and tried it. Ollivander nodded, yes, you are from a muggle family, it's normal to not know, let me tell you, this is the legendary elder wand. This is ridiculous, Hagrid exclaimed first. That's just a fairy tale. Elder wand. Lewis immediately looked at Ollivander with the look of you teasing me when he heard the term. Of course he'd heard of the elder wand, one of the legendary Deathly Hallows, the most powerful wand in the Harry Potter books. But shouldn't that be in Dumbledore's hands? Where did you get the elderberry wand, and it was sold in the store in a grand manner? Voldemort's coffin board could barely hold down. Tisk, it's boring. Ollivander shook his head helplessly. If a pure blood wizard finds this wand very interesting, a stupid wizard who thinks he has found a treasure will be interesting. Lewis's mouth twitched when he heard Ollivander's words. At that moment, he seemed to see his own shadow in Ollivander. Love to play, watch the fun is not too big of a deal. Mr. Ollivander, what do you mean? Hagrid asked suspiciously. Does pure blood wizards have anything to do with wands in this fairy tale? Harry also looked puzzled. Like Mr. Wilson, these two people were very pure people who knew nothing about wizards, so they didn't know much about the name of the bone wand. It's not quite a fairy tale, Mr. Hagrid, I thought you would know, Ollivander said indifferently. The Elder Wand, also known as the Elder Wand, is the most powerful wand that every wand maker has ever seen, have imagined making such an incomparable wand. So you made an imitation to bluff people, and specially prepared the acting skills to match it. Lewis said helplessly, aren't you deceiving customers? Since Hagrid had said it so swearingly, Lewis had no choice but to believe it, saying goodbye to Hagrid and Harry, and Mr. Lewis and Mr. Wilson carrying a lot of sundries and preparing to go home. Hagrid has his own business, and it is impossible to send Lewis home, but Lewis knows his way and does not need Hagrid. Now he just thinks about how to explain it to his mother when he gets home. Dear Mr. Wilson, have you figured out how to explain it to Mrs. Wilson? Standing in front of the bar counter, Lewis asked Mr. Wilson, who was drinking butterbeer, with a smirk. I don't know if it was because the beer tasted so weird, or because it was too difficult to take his son out to play in the middle of the night, Mr. Wilson's face was not very good looking. Just explain it normally, your mother is considerate and will understand. Mr. Wilson pushed the half-drink butterbeer to Tom the boss. My God, this wine is too boring. It's normal to not be used to it. Lewis said casually, and suddenly asked for a strange smell, only to see Rocky whose head was wrapped in circles, walked to the counter and said to Tom, one lunch, bring it to my room. Quote. Okay, guest. Old Tom replied politely, and waited until Quirrell had left before complaining. My God, he smells so bad, my guests are going to be driven away. We have a custom of respecting others, by the way, he is Indian, right, said Mr. Wilson casually. We cannot discriminate against others. Don't you know it's already discriminatory when you identify his race because of his smell? Lewis resisted the desire to complain and rolled his eyes, Dad, I'm going to the bathroom. Then hurry up, don't sneak off to play, we have to get back before lunch, or your mother will be pissed, said Mr. Wilson. Well, I'll be right back. Lewis blinked and ran away. It's all here, I can't say hello without saying hello to Voldemort. 
Dash. In the dark room, Choir and Escorel locked the door, huddled in the corner of the room and listened to the roaring voice in his head, his body trembling. Don't worry, master, I've already stepped on it, everything is ready, and I will help you get the philosopher's stone soon. Quirrell whispered to communicate with the great being possessed by himself, but under that respectful appearance, regret bit his heart like a viper. Quirrell Quirrell, a graduate of Ravenclaw at Hogwarts, a fool who thinks wisdom can help him gain strength. In order to gain strength, he flipped through the tomes, found the hideout of the legendary Dark Lord Voldemort from Clues, and tricked him out of the hiding place through rhetoric, trying to learn powerful magic from the other party. But he didn't know what kind of person he was facing. He was a bad guy who could please all the professors in his student days and make the whole school think that he was a good student with high morals and excellent grades. Insight is not something Quirrell, a little smart nerd, can imagine. Quirrell thought he was drawing knowledge from Voldemort's body. In fact, Voldemort was also secretly eroding his body. Now, Voldemort has officially attached to his body, and their lives are tied together. This made Quirrell, who had been ineffective against Voldemort, had to face the fact that if he didn't help Voldemort get the Philosopher's Stone, he would die in his body along with the Dark Lord. Therefore, he began to face his mission and began to actively step on the spot, preparing to go to Gringotts to steal the Philosopher's Stone. You've dragged on for too long. Although your body can still support half a year, you don't want to be disabled for half your life, right? The cold hoarse voice recalled in Rocky's mind, don't think about taking refuge in Dumbledore, he saves him. You can't, and he can't help you. Yes, my master, I will never betray, I will give you all my loyalty. Quirrell said with a sad face. Very good. Voldemort's voice was satisfied. Rest assured, do things for me, and you will gain infinite power and eternal life. Yes, thank you, master. Quirrell thanked Voldemort for the pie. Just as the master and servant were, kindly communicating, the originally closed door was slowly pushed open at some point, and the aging door bearing let out a harsh scream. Quirrell raised his head sharply, thinking that it was old Tom who sent someone to bring lunch, and subconsciously scolded, who let you in. As soon as he said this, Quirrell realized that it was wrong. He remembered that he had locked the door, how could it be opened so easily? Even the unlocking spell can't be so silent. When the door opened, what was revealed was not the corridor of the leaky cauldron, but the bottomless darkness, as if leading to the abyss. Quirin is Quirrell, and Voldemort. An unfamiliar voice came from the darkness at the door. Quirrell's body shook, and he looked out the door with a look of horror. Who is it? He actually revealed his biggest secret in one sentence. Cheat. No no no, I didn't say it was the Elder Wand of the Deathly Hallows, I kept saying it was an Elder Wand, didn't I? It's actually made of elder wood with Thestral Tail Feathers, is a very powerful wand, but unfortunately it is not stable and it is difficult to find a master. Ollivander shrugged. This old guy is not as kind and kind as he looks. Lewis looked at Ollivander's regretful expression and confirmed it. Mixing the truth with the lies to achieve a clear conscience, this old guy is also a master at cheating. Anyway, this wand does match me, and I should be fine with it, right? Lewis didn't plan to say anything more to the old fox. Oh, no problem, thank you for your patronage, fifteen galleons. Ollivander nodded and looked at Harry again. Your seven galleons. Wait, why are mine so expensive? Are Thestrals less common than Phoenix? Lewis exclaimed. Ah. It's not about the cost, you can ask, no wand maker can make this kind of usable elder wand like me, it's rare, that's enough, Ollivander he smiled and said, this is the manual fee. Quote dot dot dot, you're amazing. Lewis thought Ollivander was right. Obediently handing over Galleon, which is twice as expensive as Harry's, the four of them walked out of the wand shop together. After seeing the customer leave, Ollivander cleaned up the messy shop alone. He waved his hand, and the wand boxes and wands scattered on the ground floated up. He obediently found his place and got back. After a while, the messy shop was restored, tidy. Two wand boxes were left on the bench, and Ollivander put away the one that belonged to Harry and picked up the one that belonged to Lewis. On the wand box is written an inconspicuous word, trial, unfinished. That's interesting, said a smile on Mr. Ollivander's aged face, wrinkles spreading like chrysanthemums. A wand without a core resonates with a wizard. What a joke. He shook his head and burned the wand case. 
Forget it, an interesting child might be able to behave differently. Outside the wand shop, Louis, who couldn't wait for the system prompt, looked at the sign with the gold letters falling off his head, and looked down at the wand in his hand. Didn't you lie? He blinked and whispered to himself, what's the problem? Just at Ollivander's wand shop, Louis was performing a magic trick to make a muggle resonate with the wand in everyone's eyes. But without systematic feedback, it means that the performance has been seen through. The hoax failed, whether or not the seer preached it, so Lewis didn't get the fraud points from Harry, Hagrid, Mr. Wilson. The system will give feedback on every successful fraud. As long as the fraud is over, you can judge whether your fraud is successful or not based on the feedback from the system. As for admission, although Hagrid was deceived, he was only part of Lewis's entire, mixing into Hogwarts, scam, so it would not be settled until he officially received the admission letter. But the wand shop thing is obviously not such a long-term operation. This scam targeted Ollivander, making him believe that he was holding a wand and obtained the wand to admit that it was the purpose of the scam, but obviously, because of a certain link problem, Ollivander was not fooled. It's a bit of a hassle, but he didn't expose himself on the spot, so it shouldn't be a problem, Lewis thought. Dash. After buying the wands, Hagrid took Harry and the Wilsons to the owl shop. He gave Harry a snow white owl, which was named Hedwig by the delighted Harry. As a magical creature, this owl was more endearing and obedient than ordinary close relatives. Doesn't you have to have an owl to go to Hogwarts? Asked Mr. Wilson as he teased an owl in the shop with a mouse. Mr. Wilson still had the impression that the neighbor's house was devastated by owls, which made him feel a little psychological. Or you can choose a cat, or a toad, it's not too restrictive, but there needs to be one, Hagrid said. The owl's words are fitting. It can deliver letters so Lewis can always contact you at school. Can't you use a cell phone or a telephone? Mr. Wilson asked. Although I don't know what a cell phone is, Hogwarts can't use muggle appliances, Hagrid explained. Oh, it's not very convenient, let's buy an owl anyway, Mr. Wilson said to Lewis. In the end, Lewis chose a brown-yellow eagle owl with black-brown feather stripes as his partner at Hagrid's recommendation. How others choose owls, Lewis doesn't know, he picks the biggest one anyway. At this point, Lewis's purpose of coming to Diagon Alley has basically been achieved, and he can go back at this time. Although Mr. Wilson is still reluctant, he still feels that he has not seen a lot of things. Although this magical magical world is backward, its mystery is like an old wine that tastes more fragrant and makes people want to stop. It's a pity that the father and son who sneaked out have to go back. Mrs. Wilson, who will wake up and find that the father and son are not at home and only left a note, should be furious. At the leaky cauldron, before Lewis leaves, he confirms the admission letter with Hagrid again, and Hagrid assures Lewis that he has written a letter to Principal Dumbledore. Don't worry, Professor Dumbledore is very reliable and he'll take care of everything, Hagrid said. Hagrid had a superstitious trust in Dumbledore, thinking he was omnipotent. Quirinus Quirrell, and the legendary Dark Lord Voldemort. The voice in the darkness nearly scared Quirrell's soul, turning grey-white at a speed visible to the naked eye, let alone answering. The darkness at the door was swept away by the silent Quirrell, neither entering nor leaving, the situation stalemate for a while. Fortunately, Quirrell is unreliable, but Voldemort on his head is a classic self-made bad guy, and this scene can't scare him. Nissen touches people. Voldemort's voice was distorted through the thick hood. What is it that can't even speak clearly? The existence in the dark seemed very unhappy. Don't you dare to speak loudly, the trash hiding. Rude. Voldemort roared in Quirrell's head. Take off the hood that's getting in the way, and I'm going to meet this rude guy myself. Lord. Master. Calm down and don't expose yourself. Blood oozes from Quirrell's eyes, ears, mouth and nose, shocked by Voldemort's roar. Idiot, he's already called my name, do you think it's useful to play stupid at this time? It's just a laughing stock. Voldemort felt more and more that the slave he was looking for was a little mentally retarded. Quote. Quirrell didn't dare to refute Voldemort's words, and obediently removed the turban that was wrapped around his head, and turned his head tremblingly. A terrifying head gradually emerged, folded like a toad on the back of Quirrell's head to form a flat snake face. With the sound of Quirrell's arm joints rubbing, Quirrell's arm was reversed by evil magic and turned into a state dominated by Voldemort. 
He brushed Corel's hands across his face, enjoying a moment of freedom. He'd be happier if it wasn't for Corel's face behind him. Come out, since you appeared directly in front of me, compared to you are not those cowards and fools, what are you looking for from me? Voldemort looked at the darkness. Of course, I've always considered myself a genius. The darkness at the door surged, and a human figure converged in front of Voldemort. It was an English gentleman in a gorgeous tuxedo and a top hat, but a cold white mask on his face ruined his demeanor. I'm here for the simple purpose of working with you. Cooperation isn't it, let's talk about your purpose first. Voldemort's eyes narrowed, like a venomous snake raising its head before attacking. My purpose is simple. However, the moment the man opened his mouth, Voldemort suddenly raised his hand and raised Corel's wand, and the pale green light converged on the front of the wand. Avada Kedavra. With his loud shout, the legendary forbidden magic that could instantly take a person's life shot towards the person who came. He was clearly talking about cooperation, but judging from the speed at which Voldemort started, he didn't intend to have a good conversation from the very beginning. Obviously, Voldemort's murderous intentions are very heavy for this mysterious person who reveals his identity in one sentence. However, what Voldemort didn't expect was that it could easily kill any wizard, even a fire dragon with high magic resistance dragon skin would be severely injured by the life-suppressing spell, but only a layer of green light was plated on the mysterious man, and it didn't take a while. Disappear. Is this a welcome ceremony unique to your Death Eaters? Say hello with a life-suppressing spell when you meet. The mysterious man patted his tuxedo and patted the remaining green light away, as if he was slapping irrelevant dust. Voldemort was stunned when he saw this. Even if his strength was damaged, the life-threatening curse was still the life-threatening curse. How could anyone ignore it? Even if the opponent blocked or avoided him with magic, he would not be so surprised. This can only mean one thing. The person in front of him was extremely vigilant and had already prepared for it. He must have used some kind of magic item to block the life-threatening spell. And this magic item is amazingly strong, allowing him to touch the remnants of the life-sucking curse with his bare hands. Thinking of this, Voldemort regained his composure and said, If you want to cooperate with me, you must also see if you have the ability. Not all small fish and shrimps are qualified to cooperate with me. That's right, but aptitude is mutual. I have some doubts about your aptitude now. Maybe a dark lord who has lost his power is not worthy to cooperate with me. The mysterious man said with a sneer. Voldemort's eyes were gloomy, and he stared at the other party firmly. You came to me to mock me. I don't have that kind of leisure. There are many fascinating things in this world. You are just a possibility I saw in my travels. The mysterious man took off his hat and began to look through the empty hat, find something. Rabbits, pigeons, streamers, balloons, these things poured out of the hat as if they were inexhaustible, making a mess of the room. Ah, I found it. The mysterious man said cheerfully, and took out a simple note from his hat that seemed to be everywhere. He took out a pen, wrote and drew on the paper, and handed it to Voldemort in the air. It's no fun in a small country. You should be more open-minded, the mysterious man said. This is an invitation card, well, I know it's very simple, but its meaning is extraordinary. I'm inviting people from all over the world who want to change the world, and I think you have the potential. Voldemort took the note, looking at the squiggly text on it, lost in thought. Villains all over the world unite to become a family invitation. Funny Mr. Tom Riddle, I am pleased to inform you that you have been offered an opportunity to join our family. You must respect Dio Brando. Rebel. Voldemort has a greater opinion of this term than the eloquent and unintelligible production organization. I am a pioneer, a great being that brings about change. Villain is what other people call us. The world is ignorant and does not understand our noble sentiments. We call ourselves villains just to mock the mediocre vision of the world. Dio Brando waved his finger at Voldemort. You haven't practiced enough. By the way, the invitation card is given to you just to show that you are qualified to be in my eyes, but you are not qualified now. Before you are officially resurrected, remember to keep it safe, otherwise it will be lost or destroyed, but you may not have the opportunity to make it up. After handing the so-called invitation to Voldemort, Dio Brando put on his hat and turned to leave, as if he was done with his work. 
Suddenly he stopped, the lower body that had turned around was motionless, and the upper body folded over to look at Voldemort. The horrific scene made Voldemort's heart skip a beat. By the way, I'll give you a piece of advice as an investment. Dio Brando slowly stretched out his hand to the mask, you want to steal the philosopher's stone, this is a good idea, but obviously someone is smarter than you, thought of that. Your plan this time is unlikely to succeed. The philosopher's stone is no longer in Gringotts. After saying this, he had completely removed his mask, and a huge red eyeball that took up the entire face appeared in front of Voldemort. Voldemort almost missed his wand and took a subconscious step back. Good afternoon then. His eyes curved into crescents, and he let out a smirk, and with a bang, it dissipated as a white smoke. Along with it, there were rabbits running around, messy ribbons, and colorful balloons floating on the ceiling. The messy scene disappeared in an instant, the door was closed, and the lock was unscathed, as if no one had ever entered, and no one had sent any invitations to Voldemort. However, the unremarkable or even worn note was in Voldemort's hand, the handwriting on it was clearly visible, and the elegant squiggles remained. But there isn't any trace of magic on it, it's just an ordinary note. Master. Master. Rocky's voice trembled, and the pain of turning his hands and feet was tormenting him. Can you please let me go? Voldemort was silent for a moment, then let go of Quirrell's body. The bones and joints flipped again, and Quirrell turned pale, almost fainting in pain. The note with the writing on it was in his hand at this moment, and the name Diobrando appeared in his eyes. Master, should our plan continue? Quirrell asked tremblingly. Although he hadn't seen the scene where the man named Dio took off his mask, being able to survive the Dark Lord's death curse was enough to frighten him. It was comparable to the Dark Lord's heyday, no, it was even more terrifying than the Dark Lord. His words are very believable. Voldemort was silent for so long that Quirrell wondered if the Dark Lord was asleep, when suddenly, he said. Continue, of course. Voldemort's voice was steady. Whether it's true or not, verify what he said. Yes, master. Lewis came out of the toilet and was relieved to see the hand of the mage, who had no problem beside him. It was him who disguised as the so-called Diobrando just now, but instead of appearing in person, he performed a performance through an invisible magician's hand and illusion through a wall. Although he was well prepared, when he saw that Voldemort gave, Diobrando, a life-threatening spell without hesitation, he couldn't help but break into a cold sweat. Fortunately, as a magician, he thought of this possibility and took precautions in advance, otherwise it would not be funny to play with others and kill himself. But the experiment was successful, Voldemort couldn't see through illusions, even though he wasn't in very good shape, so life at Hogwarts would be safer, Lewis thought. And dig a hole for Voldemort early, the whole special organization that doesn't exist distracts him. The Dark Lord is a fitting audience, and Lewis has a hunch that he'll be his best fraud machine. As for why the pseudonym Dior, this villain from the first and third parts of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure is the savior known as the bad guy. Don't be too cool to make up an evil organization with Dior's name. But now it's not this that matters, it's. You fool an evil and powerful soul into doubting the existence of the so-called world villains united as a family. Closing square bracket. This fooling will have a huge impact on the target. You get the achievement, taunting the Dark Lord's trickster, all dark magic resistance increases by 50%. You have obtained fraud points, 700 points, the current point is 860 points. You have a chance to win a legendary lottery. Note, the legendary draw is a fourth level draw, and each draw requires 10,000 fraud points. Coming. Lewis's eyes lit up, and the continuous reward prompts made him feel like he had, made it. The 700 fraud points seemed extraordinarily cheap at this time. In comparison, whether it was the 50% resistance to black magic or the legendary lottery worth 10,000 points, he felt like he was dreaming. Sure enough, it's right to choose to go to the wizarding world. If nothing else, the higher level lottery is worth a little more thought. Lewis couldn't wait, but it wasn't the right draw in the leaky cauldron, and Mr. Wilson was waiting for him. Lewis walked out of the bathroom and found Mr. Wilson waiting at the door of the bar. Why so slow? Mr. Wilson bit off the head of a chocolate frog in one bite, feeling the strange touch in his mouth and showing a wonderful expression. Mr. Wilson really likes the wizarding world. It's a bit of diarrhea, and besides, Dad, you need to eat less candy. 
The candy in the magical world also contains sugar. Lewis, who had just fooled the Dark Lord and hid his merits and fame, said. Okay, okay, then don't eat, um, let's go. Mr. Wilson said not to eat, but still put the rest of the chocolate in his mouth, then took the big bag, pushed the door and left out. The two came to the main street of Charing Cross Street, and only when they reached the horse intersection, Mr. Wilson was a little dazed. He looked back, and there was some confusion in his eyes. It's amazing, he said. Like that motorcycle, I can't find that bar at all. Son, can you see it? Um, yes, just by the roadside. Muggle Lewis could only make an expression that I could of course see, and the powerful copying ability of Shanyan allowed him to accurately find the, blank, on the street, that is, the location of the leaky cauldron. Seeing this, Mr. Wilson suddenly sighed, compared with wizards, there is a huge gap between ordinary people. I have to admit that even the crappiest wizard is much more magical than a magician. No wonder they look down on ordinary people and call us muggles. Obviously, for this kind of real magic, as a magician, Mr. Wilson, who has been trying to create miracles with his techniques and skills, is really out of line, and even affects his self-confidence. Lewis knew this, but he didn't know how to comfort his dad either. For a magician, the advancement of civilization is meaningless, but magic is comprehensive and irresistible to all aspects of magic, and any language of comfort seems pale. So he could only choose to change the topic and ask, Dad, have you prepared a present for Mom? Ah, of course, this is an important tool that affects our life and death. Mr. Wilson came back to his senses, go, go back quickly. Although the two hurriedly hurried, they were unable to make it home before lunch, and there was no delicious lunch waiting for them at home, only Mrs. Wilson, who was on the verge of erupting in anger. Lambert, I want you to explain. Why don't you say goodbye to taking your son out to play in the middle of the night? Mrs. Wilson was so angry that she couldn't even maintain her elegant demeanor, and growled angrily. Didn't we leave you a note? Mr. Wilson explained with a smirk. It shouldn't be like saying goodbye, right? You mean that ridiculous note? I took my son to visit another world, don't read it Mrs. Wilson took out the note. Do you write in human words? Puff. Lewis, who was watching the battle from the sidelines, almost choked to death with a sip of water. He didn't expect his father to have a very dark and humorous style. God is visiting another world. Mrs. Wilson didn't call the police. It's true love. I was in a hurry at the time, so I didn't have time to think about the words, so I suddenly thought of this sentence. Mr. Wilson scratched his head. Okay dear, don't be angry, there will be wrinkles. He put his arms around Mrs. Wilson and began a shy intimacy. Bold Lewis rolled his eyes, walked into the kitchen silently and made a sandwich for himself, then carried the plate upstairs back to the room. Let the adults solve their own affairs, and it will be more pleasant to communicate with no one watching them. And he wants to do something more pleasant, which is a lottery. System, start the legendary draw. Lewis sat at the desk and said. Successful consumption, start the legendary lottery. As the prompt from the system flashed, colorful lights bloomed in front of Lewis's eyes. Without those innumerable spots of light, Lewis could only feel a phantom flashing before his eyes. A pitch black dragon with wings covering the sky and covering the sun with skeletons, a human figure with wings on its back and a golden glow, and a dashing sword fairy with a flying sword. In the end, a man in shit green stood up. Wearing the same color pants, a familiar-looking ugly monster was fixed in front of Lewis. Immediately afterwards, the phantom of the monster dissipated, turning into twelve light spots and merging into Lewis's body. Legendary lottery is completed, get the power of the Lord twelve spells. Twelve spells. Lewis's eyes lit up, almost jumping to the ceiling. The twelve spells, from the anime Chunglong Adventures, are powerful spells that run through the entire anime corresponding to the twelve zodiac signs. These spells are the source of the power of the evil dragon lord, and they are also the products left over from a spell that specifically restrains the lord. The lord who loses these spells will turn into a stone statue and only wake up once every hundred years. The rat that transforms from static to motion, the ox with infinite power, the tiger with balance of yin and yang, the rabbit with extreme speed, the dragon with bursting flames, the snake with stealth, the horse with healing, the sheep with an out-of-body soul, the deformed monkey, the floating chicken, the immortal dog, pig with electric eyes. 
Lewis knows the power of these spells well enough to make him the most powerful human in the world. As expected of a legendary lottery, this reward is unbelievably strong. Lewis felt the power surging in his body and was very satisfied. What happened to the muggles? He's a muggle who can breathe fire, transform, turn stone statues into life, and turn any object into an animal. Who can say he's a muggle? After simply trying the power of the spell, Lewis's excitement finally calmed down, and then he began to try to find the inadequacy of the power system of the twelve spells. This ability seems to have some limitations, and the limitations are not quite. Lewis said to himself. In the anime, the completely unconsumed quality of the twelve spells is preserved in Lewis. Those powers seemed to be solidified, and Galileo's coffin was nailed to the concrete floor when the upper limit of power was limited. At the same time, according to the performance in the anime, this set of spells seems to have some hidden restrictions. The power of some spells seems impossible to use at the same time. In the anime, the setting of the Holy Lord's ability to be high and low has always been criticized by the audience, especially at the end of the first season, he was pressed and beaten by the protagonist with a complete set of twelve spells. Some people say it was because of underestimating the enemy, but when he obtained the power of the twelve spells, Lewis understood the reason. Although the twelve spells are the power of the Holy Master, they are actually the product of the Holy Master's research on magic. He is a demon of fire, not an almighty demon. And the spells formed by these magical products have a very simple conflict principle. That is the mutual generation and mutual restraint in attributes. The twelve zodiac signs have their own attributes. Pigs and rats belong to the water genus, cattle, dragons, sheep and dogs belong to the earth genus, tigers and rabbits are wood, snakes and horses are fire, and monkeys and chickens are gold. Therefore, the attributes of mutual restraint cannot be used at the same time. For example, if the pig's electro-optical eye is used, there is no way to use the invisible snake and the healed horse at the same time. Ox, dragon, sheep, and dog belong to earth, and it can also be used together with water. Of course, this is for Lewis, who has a complete set of twelve spells and is incorporated into his body. If it is a physical spell, there is no taboo to use it in his hand. Of course, the power of the spell that takes effect passively is not affected, here it simply refers to the time when the power of the spell is actively released. Even with electro-optical eyes, Lewis will be immortal under the influence of the dog spell. He will only be unable to release the power of the dog spell when he releases the power of the pig spell to protect others from death. This way my Hogwarts life will be more interesting. If a real wizard can't compare to a fake wizard, who can say that fake wizards are fake? Lewis laughed, jumping up and doing three sets of one-finger push-ups. He now feels that his body is full of power, and the infinite power of the cow talisman is also a passive blessing. His current physical strength is unbelievably strong. That's why true mages learn one-handed lighting and then do all swordsmanship. It's similar to me, who has the name of a wizard, but is actually a muggle who is full of physical strength. Lewis experimented with his abilities in the room, and didn't stop to sit at the desk until he had tried it all. He picked out a random Hogwarts textbook and read it, intending to memorize them. There is still a month before the start of school. At this time, he needs to study hard, but he can't show his cowardice because of ignorance. Half a month later, Lewis sat at the desk, looking at the potions book in front of him and fell into deep thought. The owl named Fafner squatted in the cage obediently, and looked at Lewis who was reading with a pair of smart big eyes. This book is called, Thousands of Magical Herbs and Fungi, a dual subject textbook for potions and herbal medicine classes. Lewis drew it for three days and completely memorized it with the power of the wheel eye. In addition to the common knowledge of some herbs, there is a very important sentence above. A muggle can't make a potion, even if he uses the same method correctly, it can only make a goo of unknown effect. This is a sentence written by the author of this book, which not only suffocated Lewis, a muggle, but also caused him a big problem by the way. He couldn't make a qualified potion, what would he do if he took a potion class? This is not something that a powerful force can solve. Even if he shakes the material and turns yellow, he will not be able to turn into magic power. Fortunately, it was discovered early, otherwise it would be really over when it came to the end that I found that I couldn't make the potion. Lewis sighed and threw the book aside. 
In the corner of the room, there were piles of textbooks that he had read. He remembered every word of each book clearly, but he did not learn anything. Magic. He reassured himself as a muggle. It's really annoying. Lewis leaned back in his chair and stared out the window. Suddenly, a line of writing appeared in front of his eyes, which was a system prompt. You infiltrated a wizarding institution as a muggle, fooling wizards' secrecy and a number of wizards associated with your admission. You fooled the half-giant Rubius Hagrid, the legendary wizard Albus Dumbledore, the seasoned and suspicious adult wizard Minerva McGonagall, the rules of Hogwarts. Your fooling doesn't matter to the above etc. You have obtained fraud points. 4,700 points. Current fraud points. 5,560. Rewards were issued, but the results were not ideal. While a muggle admission to Hogwarts is ironic, it's a trivial matter for wizards and wizards. Lewis touched his nose. It seems like it has to be a very high-impact scam to get rewards like Voldemort. But there is one more point Lewis is very concerned about, and that is what to do to open the next level of the lottery. I started the boutique level lottery when I met and cheated the first underage wizard I met, but didn't start the next level when I cheated on an adult and powerful wizard like Voldemort. Lewis pondered the relationship, but had no clue. The items in the legendary lottery are too strong. Lewis is only an unknown level away from the legendary lottery, how can he not be in a hurry? Forget it, think about this matter slowly, let's draw a lottery first. Lewis looked at his fraud points. 5,560 points. Enough for 10 consecutive draws. Whether it's a writing wheel eye or a space ring, the help to me is not small, and the prize draw is not to be underestimated. Lewis is gearing up. System, arrange a 10 draw for me. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and support our channel.